thank you very much for the introduction. And so this talk was supposed to be given by Henri Dormont, my co-author, but unfortunately he couldn't be here today. Um, so I'll try my best to substitute him. Of course, that will be, will be very hard. Um, okay, so today I'll, I'll talk about multiplexity points. And as you can see, can, can imagine from the title, this work is uh, greatly inspired by Ian Nekovar's and Tony Scholl's conjectures. Uh, in fact, the way I think about the work I've done in the past three or four years is really, uh, you know, testing these conjectures in explicit, for like the explicit consequences that their conjecture predict. So in a sense, I'm kind of doing uh, science as you're supposed to do it. Um, <coughs> um, yeah, another thing, uh, like the, if for those that were here at uh, Tony Shaw's lectures, uh, they might remember the last question he received, and it was about really constructing points uh, for higher rank elliptic curves. So, you know, if, if, you, if you could connect the two talks, this is, you know, the perfect continuation, because I'm trying to, I'm going to try to answer a little bit uh, that last question. Um, so the main, you know, an example to keep in mind for this talk is really of an elliptic curve, let's call it E0, given by the following equation, y squared equals x cubed minus 524x plus 4624. So in a, it's an elliptic curve over Q of conductor 2 to the 6th times 109, and its algebraic rank over Q is 2. Okay, so this construction of points should give us a way to study the Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture for this kind of elliptic curves. And as the rank over Q is 2, uh, the question, the Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture cannot be approached with the usual methods of ignore points, for example. So one has to do something different. And you know, the, the usual strategy is you, you find a quadratic imaginary field. In this case, we could take k q square root of minus 2, uh, where the rank doesn't change. So we, look, we get again equal to 2. And then we try to construct points using this extra information. All right, so one, one reason why I took this elliptic curve is that, so its quadratic twist over k is an elliptic curve of prime conductor, 109, of rank 0, because the rank over k remains 2. And, and that will allow me to simplify the assumptions in this talk, just to, to make everything much more concrete. So I'm going to consider an elliptic curve over q of conductor p. k over q quadratic imaginary and crucially we want uh, p inert in k and well the, our main result is uh, the construction of uh, an object, which I'm going to denote Q of K, which will live into the local block cattle Selmer group at P, tensor the global one. Uh, so if you remember uh, Tony Shaw's lecture, like the, the platy conjecture should produce elements into the second exterior power in this case. But since you can see the second exterior power in the tensor product, this is very reminiscent of their conjectures. No, no, this is like the, the H1. And yeah, like the properties are the important ones. So that the first property, which will answer the question, is that QK is Selmer, meaning belongs, I can put F here. 
if and only if uh, the L value of the elliptic curve over k is equal to 0. So the obstruction of being Selmer is measured by the L value. Yeah, maybe another thing I should have mentioned, like the fact that we choose conductor p and p inert uh, forces the sign of the functional equation to be plus 1. So we are in an even situation, uh, even order of vanishing setting. OK, so this is the first uh, result. And the second one, which is recent, we, we haven't put it out yet, is that, well, now we, we can ask what happens if the L value vanishes so that the class is Selmer and the class is non-zero. So if we believe the Plattie conjecture, something of, you know, of this shape should be some avatar of the second derivative of the L function. And so what we prove is that in this case, the Selmer rank is 2. So the P Selmer rank of E over K is equal to 2. So it really uh, behaves as it should. This equals? Yeah, equals 2. Yeah, like there is a <coughs> OK, I'll, OK, maybe the plan of the talk now will be to give, uh, I'll, I'll get there. So the plan of the talk is to give an overview, like the comparison of the Platy conjectures with this framework setup and explain the construction of this invariant because that's somehow like the part that's closely related to uh, the Platy conjectures. Uh, if, if people are interested, I'll be happy to say a few words at the end about this, uh, like about this result. Uh, just for, yeah, for those that are very eager, I can give you like an idea of this. So it's possible to relate this uh, mock plectic invariant uh, through the Iwasawa main conjecture um, to the, this, the Selmer group. So the non-vanishing of the Selmer group give an, ups an upper bound on the Selmer rank. The fact that we know that this is non-zero tells us that this, the rank is positive. And then we use, so I can cite uh, one of Jan's work, we use the parity conjecture to deduce that the Selmer rank is actually 2. All right. Michele? Yes. Uh, how, I mean, I, I think it's the same amount, but how could you possibly show that it's exactly two? So I can give an upper bound using the Iwasawa main conjecture. Like, it's actually sufficient one, one of the two inclusion, the one coming from Euler systems. And as I said, like, knowing that the class is non-zero gives the it... The fact that the class is non-zero, okay. okay. Tells it that there is something, and then the parity gives the result. So you write this class to get the Gell function? How do you use the main conjecture? Uh, it's like the main conjecture that we the proof is like the parent use uh, Higner point main conjecture. Oh, so you're related to the Higner point main conjecture? Yes. Yeah, because like again, an, one not, another feature which is very interesting uh, in this setup is that P is inert in K. So it's a, you know, usually when people do it was our theory, like to take P split. So the fact that we take P inert, uh, will force the sign of the functional equation to change in the tower, in the anticyclotomic tower. And so we have Higner points in the tower, and we can use them to, to do something over the base. But I, I'm, I think I'm going a bit ahead of myself, so I would like to give uh, an overview, uh, as I was saying, of like, the connection between the Platy conjectures and uh, yeah, this result. So let me begin by recalling the setup of Jan Nekovars and Tony Scholl's work. So here, uh, I'm going to, again, consider the simplest possible setting where things are already interesting. And you can imagine how to extend this, uh, you know, if the conductor is not prime and, and so on. OK, so let's take now f over q, real quadratic. And an elliptic curve over f of conductor 1. All right, so to study uh, the burton smith conjecture for, in this setting for higher rank, the right geometric object to consider is a Hilbert modular surface. So here I'm going to just call it SF. 
And I'm going to assume f as narrow class number one, just to, again, simplify everything. And the complex uniformization is simply as a quotient of h cross h, the a product of two uh, Poincare upper half plane by SL2 OF. Okay. So this is a surface, is even algebraic, defined over Q. And OK. So the first conjecture, or at least one of the first conjectures that observe uh, a relation between the arithmetic of E and that of F was formulated by Oda. So this was, I think, in 82. And he conjectured that if we look at the second uh, cohomology group as a rational Hodge structure, and we look at the isotypic component corresponding to this elliptic curve, which actually in this case we know it's even modular, um, this should be isomorphic to the tensor product of two weight one Hodge structures coming from E. So here, maybe new I will be the two embeddings of F. And then we can look we get this. Or at least that's the conjecture. So okay, this is some statement about hot structures, but concretely the way I I remember it is that we discovered that periods of a real analytic um, two forms on, on this surface compute the periods <coughs> of these two complex elliptic curves, E nu 1 and E nu 2. OK. OK, so there, there is, it was, you know, uh, becoming apparent already in the 80s that there was this connection. Uh, connection. But the, you know, the, the vision that uh, Jan Neckhoff and Tony Scholl had was to, to even predict how to, to produce this invariant for the elliptic curve. So the, what they conjectured, so this is Neckhoff and Scholl. And I, I guess like the first time I've seen it written down was in, 20, you know, when in the paper introduction uh, to plectic cohomology. Uh, so it says that, you know, if we took CM points on SF for some K over F, you know, this plectic formalism should give a way to produce elements, as we said, into the wedge 2 H1K VP. Right, and as I said, like it's really convenient for us to think about this as uh, some subset of the tensor product of the H1. So this, you know, this, the elements obtained in this way by this plectic cable Jacobi map should be called plectic uh, Higner points. Because of course, if you run this argument uh, with a Shimura curve instead of uh, the surface, that's what you get, Higner points. All right. So I, f I first heard uh, about this conjecture in 2016 at uh, the Rubin uh, birthday conference. Uh, but at the time, I had just started my PhD, so I didn't really understand much of what was going on. And it took me a few years to, uh, yeah, to, try to try to do something. But I think already at the time, uh, I remember in that talk, Jan Nekovar was uh, hinting at a connection between Henri Dormont's uh, theory of star Higner points. OK, so then uh, a couple of years ago, like three or four years ago, I started to think, in what, what can I do uh, in this, uh, for these conjectures? So if you do, if like me, you did that your PhD in Montreal, you, learn, you would have learned that if there is something global that you would like to do, but you, you don't know how, uh, you know, your best chance is to do something periodic, and maybe you'll get lucky. So the, the setting is slightly different. So again, f will be real quadratic. 
Uh, but now we want to take an elliptic curve of conductor P. Uh, P and we want it to be split. So it's a product of P1 and P2. Right, so in this case, uh, instead of a an Hilbert modular uh, surface, we get a quaternionic uh, Shimura curve, a Shimura surface. Which again, I'm going to just describe now as the periodic uniformization. So th the reason why I, I, I put myself in this set setup is that the Shimura surface will be attached to equatorial algebra over f, totally indefinite, but ramified at the two primes above p. So it has a model over q, bad reduction, and in fact, periodic uniformization. So uh, s of p, I guess I'm going to denote it, will be, again, I'm just going to give the periodic uniformization, but again, it has a model over q if we want, and it will be a quotient now of hp1 cross hp2. So the two Dreamfeld periodic upper half plane, modulo the action of some p arithmetic subgroup. So here it's the usual behavior when you do uniformization at, at this kind of in this kind of settings, is that you switch invariants at p at infinity. And so you real, you find this, this group inside a definite quaternion algebra, the totally definite quaternion algebra, which is a ramified at every finite place. All right. So this is the natural uh, geometric object, two-dimensional geometric object to consider. And maybe let me say, for those that are not familiar with this, is that the HPI is really P1CP minus P1FPI. So the Dreamfeld periodic upper half plane. OK. Can you write down what BP was? Because I just. Gamma P? BP, it's a quaternion algebra over F, totally indefinite, and ramified only at P1 and P2. Okay, and you haven't used it yet? Yeah, it, it comes, I mean, this is the quaternionic uh, surface oh, okay. attached okay, to that. Okay, so you have nothing. So it has discriminate P1, P2. So it has a model over Q, it has bad reduction because it's ramified at the two primes, and so it has a periodic uniformization of this oh, kind. Yeah, okay, correct. Yeah, okay. Yes. All right, so what's the analog of Euler's conjecture in this setting? So in this case, it's actually a theorem. So it's a theorem, so something we proved, uh, uh, I proved with uh, Leonard German. So this was, uh, I think it actually appeared only uh, this year, but yeah, it came out in 2021 and it's based on uh, a paper of Leonard and Rosso from 2022 uh, about the equality of arithmetic uh, and uh, automorphic L invariants. And the idea is here is that periods, so I'm just going to write it in you know, this informal way as I did before, periods of uh, region analytic uh, two forms on SP compute. Okay, now we're doing something periodic. I chose an elliptic curve with multiplicative reduction at P1 and P2. So I have Tate uniformizations and Tate periods. So they, this compute uh, the Tate periods. of, well, we can look at E over FP1 and E over FP2, right. Okay, so once you're in this setup, the natural thing to do is try to, you know, to find some periodic formula for uh, neck covariantial plectic points. So again, this is again in, in, in the same work with, uh, with Leonard we show that there is a natural map that you can construct from CM points uh, on SP 
So these four, uh, again, now uh, CM, quadratic CM extensions of F. Uh, and if there are CM points in here, it means that P1 and P2 are inert in K. So here where P1, P2 are inert. Okay, and so there is a map. Again, this, this was for Nea German 23. Uh, but we were only getting something into the local points. So it's some completed tensor product of the local points, which if we want to really write it in terms of group cohomology, this is, you know, the locals block out of Selmy groups, right? You know, up, maybe up to inverting P, but okay. Okay. So we we wrote down this construction. Uh, one nice feature again is that it's actually it's unconditional. We could construct these elements here. We could um, you know relate it to higher derivatives of anticyclotomic periodical functions. And the tensor product is over Z or Z P. Um, so here, it's the compl the periodic completion. So you can think of completing and do over Z P. But this is you know I'm mostly inverting P. So let's say even over Q P here. I mean these are basically Z P squared tensor Z P squared. So you're tensoring over Z and completing. But yes. Just yeah, like abstractly, that's what it is. Okay, so I was saying like the advantage of this construction is that it was explicit, we could relate to higher derivatives of anticyclotomic periodical functions. Uh, we could prove algebraicity, so we could show that these points were global in special settings, but again relying on the theory of Wigner points. And in a complementary work with um, Mark Masdeu and Chevy Guitar, um, we, we computed numerically these quantities, but in a setting where you know the extension is almost totally real. Okay, I'm not gonna uh, expand on that, but there, so there are like the, the advantage of this construction, as I was saying, is really allows you to test these uh, platy conjectures. So numerically, even theoretically. So the equality you wrote is after inverting p. Yes, yes. In, yeah, at the end, you know, I just you know, I guess the, the point of of this work is really studying you know non-torsion settings where the rank is two, right? So that that's the only. You can ask for finer information before inverting P, but that's not uh, super important. And yeah, we call these, these points we, uh, plectic uh, Stark-Igner points because they were highly inspired by uh, the original work of Henri Darmon in, in this setting. But okay, maybe like, the, the difference is that uh, Darmon's constructions were really for rank one setting, and this is the generalization that should apply for higher rank. Okay, and maybe another comment that I can make coming from uh, Tony's lecture is that at the end he was making some comment about uh, you know local points of elliptic curves over Q being too small for studying elliptic curves of rank two, and I, I assume like the comment came from. The fact that for uh, this our construction being, loc being local uh, didn't allow us to study elliptic curve or rank 2 over Q. Because again, uh, everything was forced to vanish for, local re for, for trivial reasons. OK, so now we fast forward a year or two. And then you know, this spring, I was at the uh, MSRI, thematic semester. And I was lucky that Henri was there as well. And, and so we started talking about extending this construction, but like for elliptic curves over Q. And so this is the, I'm going to describe the mock setting. And I hope that having uh, shown this progression, it will seem much more natural what I'm going to do now. So here we're going to ba go back to this setting. So E over Q elliptic curve uh, of conductor P. Uh, K, uh, no, okay. 
for the moment just this. What is the natural uh, geometric object to consider? So these are what are called mock uh, Hilbert Maldra surfaces. So the name apparently originates from Barry Mazur, because these are spaces that are really studied in his uh, PhD thesis, or started studying his PhD thesis. So here I'm going to take S mock. Again, in this case, it's just going to be a topological space. There's no, I don't think there is, we know of more structure than just that of a topological space. And it will be a quotient of HP times H modulo SL2 Z1 over P. Right, so this is, uh, you know, the region analytic space and the Poincaré upper half plane taught as you know, complex manifold. And then here is the action of SL2 Z1 over P. So it's a P arithmetic subgroup, but not in a definite quaternion algebra. It's really in SL2. So, okay, there is a mixture of different uh, anal analysis. And yeah, we're the, the, the action is nice and the quotient is a well behaved topological space. But okay, so what can we. Uh, uh, extend this, uh, these two steps in this setting. So the first one, which was really the inspiration for our work uh, in, in this more geometric setting, was actually studied by Henri again. So Darmon, this was, I think, 2001. And as our work was based on, on the paper of uh, German and Ross, so his work, or like this particular result, was based on uh, greenberg Stevens proof of the maser tate atelbaum conjecture. So this, I think, was uh, 93. And again, as we have heard uh, yesterday, I think the maser tate atelbaum conjecture was from 86 or 84. OK, so what, uh, what is the statement in this case? Again, I'm going to just state it vaguely, meaning that periods of some holomorphic two form on S mock. And here again, it's really, you know, it, one has to make sense of what is this holomorphic two form, but it's possible. Uh, so periods of this form compute uh, the Tate periods or the Tate period. of E over QP. All right. OK, so you see, uh, we, we, seem, we seem to have everything. Uh, but we don't have the two periodic primes to do the same construction. Um, OK, but there is a way around that. And what we end up doing is constructing a map from CM points on uh, SMOC. For k over q, again quadratic imaginary where p is inert. Uh, let me just write it for p inert. So we show that it exists. So this is, I guess, what I said, like the content of that work. So uh, Darmon, sorry. For now, from this year. And we, we get something into. H1F KP tensor H1K now global over VP. All right. And you see, we, in, you know, having something which is global on one component uh, avoids the forced uh, vanishing that we were obtaining in this setting. Yes. The CM points on S mark is it, is it just the, the, uh, the CM elliptic curve on the real part, or, is, or what do you put in the HP bar? Okay, so here again, when I say CM points, I'm really thinking, I guess, from the algebra point of view. So I'm thinking about an embedding of K into. But into what? Because you can embed it into H or HP or both. I mean, uh, you can embed in M two of Q, and then you can act on both copies, right? Uh, and because P is inert, we have a fixed point, uh, or like, I mean, or a 
pair of conjugate fixed points and a single fixed point here. Okay. And so that's, that's, that, that's what I mean with, by a CM point. Okay. So, so this was like for the uh, overview. And I was planning for the rest of the talk to give you an idea of how to construct, or wh what I mean by this holomorphic two-form and how to construct this map. So this map is going to be this, uh, you know, a, a, sh a shadow of the eclectic Abel Jacobi map um, that is obtained by some mixture of Piatic and Archimedean integration. All right, so plan, plan for the rest of the talk. So the first thing, as I said, uh, define, well, this two form as mock, which I'm, you know, since that's a quotient, I can really think of as some two form on HP cross H. Uh, fixed by gamma, and gamma is going to be SO2 Z1 over P. And then the second part, I guess I'm going to answer again uh, uh, Olivier's question. So if uh, I take K, my quadratic imaginary field, which is Q of tau, then I can embed this into C and into CP in such a way that, well, the image of tau, which I call tau infinity into C, will belong to uh, H, or otherwise I take complex conjugate. And here I get TP and TP bar, which now will belong to HP, because P is inert. All right, and yeah, the eclectic invariant then will, or uh, yeah, the QK that I defined it before will be some double integral from tau p to tau p bar from tau infinity to I infinity of this two form. Yeah, maybe I guess I want the multiplicative version here. All right. Are there any questions about this? Yes. Can you put more structure than the topological space on this model? Not that I know of, but uh, maybe someone in the audience has ideas, yeah, like to mix Piatic and Archimedean analysis. I, I don't know. So the, w what kind of product, I mean, is there a, like you have a complex manifold and then the Piatic thing is either a, you take the naive points or you take it in an Arctic space or a Belkovich space. So you see, like it's gonna be very concrete. It's n no nothing, no stacks, nothing's fancy. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll start explaining it now. Just a set. A uh, regional analytic space. It's really you know it's important that this has a structure of regional analytic space. So it's just the G one over K embedded into this. Is is what? G one. It's like just the regional analytic space. So it's the G one over K. It's like a CM torus embedded into this space. If you want to think about it that way. What stops you from taking more primes? Um, yeah, like there's this thing that if you, you know, you want something piotic, so if you have more primes, you have different topologies and, and then they don't behave very well together. But yeah. Okay, so let me begin by explaining what is this uh, holomorphic two form. And for this, I need to remind you a little bit about the uh, piotic upper half plane. So the piotic upper half plane has a map from so as a reduction map to the Bruatitz tree for PGL2 QP. So this is a picture for P equals to 2. So it's a homogeneous tree of uh, uh, such that every vertex has P plus 1 edges. And one way to think about HP is some tubular neighborhood of this tree. So I'm going to draw it now. So it's something that looks like this and goes on. And well, to every vertex, the pre-image of a vertex is going to be an affinoid in HP. So in this case, something okay, like this. Okay. 
and then to each edge of the tree, oriented edge, I get an um, unoriented annulus. So here I get, for example, I'm, I'm looking at this situation, so I get an annulus here, an annulus here, and here. All right. So one way, another way to picture this is that you remember HP is P1 CP minus P1 QP. And so when you go towards the end of the tree, what you're seeing is the points that you are removing. So one, you know, like the ends here will parameterize at infinity P1 QP. So, so th is this like uh, uh, the annuli, is it like you have locally some few arc, okay, so something like uh, P1 minus 3 disk, this is the Thing here. Okay, in yeah, like you, you take P1, you remove like a unit disk around 0, 1, and infinity, yeah. and that gives you the standard affinoid coming from the vertex, and then you get annular uh, around that. So it's a very combinatorial and very you know, hands on point of view, but it allows us to, to describe differential forms on HP. <laughs> so the reason why we can do that was discovered by uh, Schneider and Teitelbaum many years ago, and they realized that uh, differential forms on HP are, um, can be recovered from the collection of the residues at all these annuli. And so we're, we're going to use this point of view to define uh, our two forms. First of all, what did, if there is a foundational question, what does it mean of the two forms on such a space? Absolutely. That's what I'm going to tell you soon. Definition. So again, this is due to Darmon in 2001. Uh, so elements of H2 as mock are functions C from the edges of the tree into one forms on H such that uh, they satisfy some properties. Like they, this should be thought as the collection of residues of a two-form. And looking at the tree, we, we would want the following three properties. So the first one is that if we change orientation on our annulus, we should get a different sign on the residue. So C of E should be minus C of E bar. So doing a bar on an edge just switches the orientation. So this for every E, e P. The second step is, is some kind of uh, an equivalent of the residue theorem for uh, a meromorphic differential on a Riemann surface that tells you that the sum of the residue is zero. So here the sum over the edges with a fixed uh, source of this thing should be zero, as I said. So this for every V. All right, and okay, so this would be, that's how, you, what you think of uh, the two form on HP cross H. We want really a form on the, on, on the quotient. So we need to impose some uh, invariant uh, property for the action of SL2Z1 over P. So we, we require that if we pull back C of gamma E, we should get, uh, should be equal to C of E. So this for all gamma in big gamma. All right. Your, your convention is, a, is the same as set. You have two edges between, pairs of edges, being opposite, with opposite orientation. Yes, yes, A, it's, oriented, it's an oriented tree for right. us. And you have, but you have two. Yeah, yeah like, yeah, well, yeah, you choose one or the other. Yeah, so for E bar is the E with the other. Yeah, the opposite yeah. orientation, yes. All right. Okay, so now we have um, 
we have a notion of differential form. I, as I said, it's very natural, generalizes uh, what uh, Schneider and Teitelbaum did in the case of differential forms on HP or like Shimura curves with bad reduction at P. Is there a Dorn complex? Uh, maybe. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. And okay, so I, I define for you what are the differential form, but I need to make sense now of this integration. So in a sense, it's a very convenient, um, convenient way to, to package information about our elliptic curve. Because now, okay, yeah, one thing I should, should have said is that uh, there exists, so this is maybe a fact, there exists an edge, which I'm going to call E infinity, such that the stabilizer in gamma of this edge is the usual subgroup of SL2Z uh, denoted by gamma naught of P. Uh, so we can define, well, this two form that I said, so it should be some function from HP to um, EP to H1H by, so I'm just going to tell you what is the value at the special edge. And then by, by this gamma invariant, I can, one can deduce all the, the, the rest. And this is just going to be, of course, the weight 2 modular form uh, or level p attached to our elliptic curve of conductor p. So this is going to be weight 2 gamma naught of p. And in fact, p nu. Right. And I, this, that's crucial. Because if I give you this definition, the first property and the last property are automatic. But this vanishing property here really follows from the fact that f of e is p nu. So b follows from uh, the fact that it's p nu. All right. So it's for this um, uh, two form that I really proved this relation between the periods and the Tate period of the elliptic curve. All right. So I'm just going to tell you the two uh, integrations. So now the Archimedean integration. And again, very naively, we have a function now from the edges to h1. We, the way I wrote it, we want some line integral. So it's very natural to just you know, do the line integral, right? So I can define c of e of tau infinity. So this is going to be a function now. Well, if I do an integral, a priori is just in c. And, and I would get something of this form. I could, I don't know, maybe I normalize by 2 pi i and I integrate z dz, where maybe I'm going to also call f of e omega e of e, which should be a one form. Right. What is the problem with this definition is that it's not gamma invariant. So what, what you should do? Well, you take the class with respect to the periods of this uh, modular form of A2. So we get something modulo periods, and this is just the complex, uh, complex points of the elliptic curve. And in fact, you really need to multiply by the torsion of the elliptic curve over Q to, to avoid you know, small indeterminacies. But OK, so the point is that this is gamma invariant. All right. And now we go to the uh, p-adic integration. And luckily, I still have the picture here. I can explain to you a relation between these special functions that 
for those that might know it, are also called harmonic cycles, and measures on the boundary of HP, so on P1, QP. So what's the connection? If you take an edge, for example, this one, let's say this is A infinity, you can get a compact open subset of P1, QP just by looking at all the ends of the tree that, that pass through this special edge. So if I look at all this thing, I'm going to get some, oops, some compact open subset of P1, QP. And these properties of, of this function uh, translates into the, the properties that the periodic measure on P1, QP sh should satisfy. So in, in this way, this function or harmonic cycle valued in points on the elliptic curve give rise to some measure. So it's a measure on P1, QP valued in points of the elliptic curve and gamma invariant. And in fact, it also has total mass zero. And the connection is simply the one I just stated. So if I want to evaluate this measure at some compact open sub subset of P1 QP, I just evaluate my function. And since these compact opens are form a basis for the PR topology, that's enough to determine this measure. So now we have a measure, and it's, if you have seen these things, or like if you've worked uh, as Henri has done many times, you, you might uh, realize that the right way to do this is by the following way. So we integrate in a multiplicative way from tau to tau p bar, what we have done before. So this is going to be defined as some form of multiplicative integral over P1 QP of a function which has divisor TP minus TP bar. So it's going to be T minus TP, T minus uh, tau P bar with respect to this measure, which I remind you is again valued in points on the elliptic curve. So again, like the integration is really in a sense of naive. So it's defined as a limit of Riemann products. And, well, it's a limit, so it should take value in some periodically complete space. Products? Products. Okay. Yeah, I want to think of this as some multiplicative, valued in multiplicative group. And, well, it will have valued in Kp elements of Kp star of norm 1 over Qp, tensor over Z, say, with Ec. And as I said, we, we I need to periodically complete. But we get the first problem. So E of C is divisible, so this is zero. Okay, so it seems we haven't done anything because we constructed zero in a very complicated way. But the fact is, is that we didn't use everything uh, we, 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 we had, right? So one well, one crucial observation here is that what we are doing is not just getting some complex points of the elliptic curve, but these are really Higner points. So they're valued in very nice algebraic extensions of K. So complex multiplication implies that C of E of tau 
is really valued in E of k infinity, where k infinity is the union of Ren of the ring class fields of conductor p to the n. And well, the, the nice fact about this group is that it's not divisible. And in fact, because uh, the torsion subgroup defined over k infinity is finite, you can check that the, uh, well, the map from E of k infinity inside uh, the Piatti completion as finite kernel. The reason is that if the torsion is finite, the group of points modulo torsion is free, and so the completion, it's nice enough. All right, so now we, we can do the same thing as I described here, just that now we don't get zero. We get something which is, okay. I'm gonna go to the last board. Yes. All right. Okay. So as I said, instead of landing here, now we land, we get this tau p, tau p bar tau infinity, i infinity, omega e. The point cannot become more and more divisible in the tau k m. More and more divisible. Because the torsion is finite. There is finite torsion over k infinity. Okay, so we take the conjugate, okay, okay, okay. Okay, and so what we found is that this is actually an element of kp1 star tensor over yeah, let's say we complete this so we can do over ZP and then we land into here, right. But there is another information that we haven't used, not just complex multiplication, but Shimura reciprocity. So by Shimura reciprocity, we can even say that this is in the is fixed by the Galois group of k infinity over k, right? And now what is the connection with what I wrote at the beginning? Well, there is an inclusion uh, given here by Tate uniformization, tensor uh, the Kummer map, and here we're also using inflation restriction to land into H1F Kp tensor H1 K VPE. Again, over QP if you want. And okay, maybe if I invert P is not injective, but okay, let's say I'm up in this way. And the image of this quantity is our mock plectic point. All right. So I think I'm almost out of time. Um, okay, maybe just a, 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 big, a, a quick summary. What we have done here is that we, another way of saying this, we constructed a measure valued in Higner points, and we computed this integral in this way. And this turned out to be an object in, in a space that looks a lot like this, the target of the Plectic cable jacobi map that uh, should exist according to the conjectures. Uh, one important feature of this construction is that be having this connection with Higner points uh, allows us to prove 
these two statements that I wrote here. Uh, in fact, the, the, we were, uh, Henri especially was very happy that there was this connection between the platy conjectures and the work Henri had done with Bertolini in the 90s. So this uh, statement reduces to a theorem that Henri and Bertolini proved, I think, in 97. So it's this paper with an appendix of Basel Xoven. And so you can get this result here. And as I was saying, this other result uh, can be proved using the Higner point he was our main conjecture. Um, so which gives a much stronger result than anything we could prove with our previous approach. So I'm going to stop here. Oh, sorry, be before uh, the questions, I was told that being the last speaker, I, I should be the, I, I know I'm not old enough to do this, but I would like to thank the organizers for, for this great conference and all the other speakers for, for coming here. Okay, so the, are there any questions? For yeah, me? did you compute your QK in your special example? Uh, when you say computing mean, means... Did you check it was non-zero? No, that's, uh, that's a problem. In the sense, uh, at, at the moment, I don't know of a way of checking numerically, say, that this is non-zero. Yes. That should depend on the primary. No, that should depend on the second derivative. Yeah, yeah like that, that should be an hour. In fact, um, you know, the fact that we're integrating from tau p to tau p bar, uh, somehow forces, so this is not the most refined invariant that one could construct, it's some invariant that, um, you know, will land in a specific eigenspace uh, for the action of complex conjugation. So if you remember, I, I chosen this example exactly because uh, in this case, uh, like the conjecture would be that the invariant is non-zero. So in, in, in this special setting of elliptic curve of conductor P, uh, our conjecture would be that this invariant is non-zero exactly when uh, the rank is uh, 0 over Q and 2 over K when uh, P is, um, is split, of, uh, is a prime of split multiplicative reduction. And it's uh, non-zero also when uh, the rank is 1 over Q and 2 over K when P is a prime of uh, non-split multiplicative reduction. So there are cases that are missing in, in this description. And the reason is that, the, again, this is not the most refined invariant. So we have work in progress trying to refine this construction. And yeah, an, another way to, to understand why that's the case is that this should be some kind of leading term of an anticyclotomic periodical function. And as many people in the audience know, like these have you know, extra degeneracy coming from, again, the action of complex conjugation, say. But yeah, but yeah, I guess one, one good way of, one advantage of this point of view is that it you now know what you should do in order to refine this invariant and do some integration, like in this case, just depending on tau p and not tau p bar. Sure. Is there one analog of this theory uh, for the, the higher dimensional uh, if you have uh, spaces and you have a thesis really? Uh, I, I'm not sure I understood the question, but I, I'm going to try an answer and then maybe you tell me if I, I got it right. Oh, or, or can you repeat the question? Yeah. Is there one analog of this theory for the higher dimensional uh, periodic dream field after all uh, spaces and uh, uh, corresponding prohibits uh, buildings? Oh, okay. That I, I don't know. Probably I would say no. In the sense that here we're really using, you know, we know that elliptic curves are really GL2 type objects. So I guess you were thinking about more like unitary groups and, and so on. So I, I don't think that the connection would be as direct. One thing I can say though is that, yeah, one, one nice thing of this point of view, uh, thanks to the platy conjecture, is that it has, you know, you can imagine natural generalizations, again, to totally real fields and higher rank elliptic curves. In fact, this point of view where where we use the fact that Higner points are algebraic, can be used also in the original construction uh, we developed with uh, Leonard German to upgrade our local points into something that looks like this, some global cohomology group and, and a tensor product of local things. 
Yes. Yeah. Maybe may before there is no criteria, have no criteria to determine whether the class is non-zero. Yeah. So I mean, but I mean, uh, so you cover means so there's no kind of like growth that from uh, related to PID or from this stuff, right? I mean, like I. I guess I would expect, you know, if you could compute the height of this element, like you, as we have seen yesterday, there, you know, you could imagine computing some periodic height of this, and then the, the criterion could be, you know, if the height is non-zero, then the element is non-zero, and then you get all the consequences. But what I wanted to say is that at this moment, at least, I or like we haven't really thought about this question. You expect the second-order term of an anti-cyclotomic periodic L function would be related to the height, this QK. No, so what actually, yeah, part of like the proof of this result is that you can interpret this element as the first derivative of an anticyclotomic periodic function, but which in a sense interpolates first derivatives. So if you go back and look at one of the first papers Bertolini and Darmon wrote in the 90s, it's, it's called something Higner points on Mumford curves. So they have all these, uh, you know, very nice um, study of all the possible settings, and there is something called the definite setting. And there you have like genuine periodical functions. And there is the indefinite setting, which is a setting where like the Higner point main conjecture uh, is relevant, where like the sign over the anticyclotomic tower is minus one. So you, uh, you don't, you know, you have order of all odd order of vanishing in the tower. And so you cannot expect to have a L function interpolating special values because those vanish. Mm -hmm. But you can expect a, something that looks like a periodical function that interpolates first derivative. So Higner points. And so this guy is going to be the first derivative of this periodical function. So it's, in a sense, something that computes, uh, yeah. So that first derivative computes the second derivative? Uh, it re it's related to the second derivative of a putative, you know, complex cell function. Yeah. Yes. So, um, so th this QK, it kind of lands. Um, Maybe if you localize also the second uh, factor. But anyway, it lands in some tensor product, and you said you can then project that to the wedge squared. Yes. Um, do you know that it actually, like, there you assume that QK is non zero. Should you be assuming, like, do you know that it projects non zero to the wedge squared? Because there's also the sim squared where it could project. Uh -huh. Like, if it was non zero, it could project in a non zero way to sim squared, which is also a factor of the second tensor power. Mm -hmm. You know it's like alternating in some way, so you know it always... Yeah, the conjecture would be that this is... Maybe I can, I can write it down, maybe here. So. And that will probably... Uh, yeah, you're right, probably could answer that question. So the conjecture, again, would be that... So we can consider the following regulator. Um, so you take P wedge Q and you're going to send it to the determinant, right? You want something uh, here, so you localize at P, you localize Q, and here you just take um, the, the Kummer map, so Kummer map of P, kuma map of, P, of Q, and in fact, you you really apply, you're applying some one minus a p sigma p to it in this case, which has to do with the fact that we are integrating from tau p to tau p bar. So it should be something that lives into the wedge two, and you write that it might have non-trivial projection to this the other part, the sim squared. You'll, you also have a map from sim squared uh, yeah. to such a tensor product. Uh, might be interesting to know whether that map is ever. Yeah, oh, sorry. And the conjecture is uh, QK belongs to the image of this. Yeah. It, it's still unclear to me how you prove that the rank of the sum of group is exactly two. Because, but, I mean, maybe it was implicit in what you explained, but uh, uh, are, you, are you saying that QK is a first class of some departed or a system, something like that? Or? 
No, no, no. It's uh, so y as I said. How do you rule out that there's many more rational points than it took in that sense? That's my question, more or less. So the the Wasami conjecture allows you to bound the char characteristic ideal of the torsion part of the, the dual, like of X, right? In terms of the index, right, the characteristic ideal of the index of uh, the inverse, the projective limit of ignorant points in the tower, right? Um, and you can interpret that index in terms of, you know, the or, you know how many times uh, or in, in which power of the augmentation ideal this uh, limit of ignorant points live in. But, but these ignorant points are not of 2k, right? No, no, they're in, in the tower, yes. Yeah. So they are not your QK. Yes. They are not inverse limits of QK. Okay, so, so you need to relate this to your QK. Yes. And then, yeah, and then you, yeah, like the, the fact that QK is non zero, which is essentially, as I said, the first derivative of this inverse limit of ignorant points, uh, tells you that uh, the characteristic ideal of this quotient is uh, less or like the order at the augmentation ideal of that is less or equal than than two. But that's generic. Yeah, I mean, I no, no, but I'm looking at, at just the uh, augmentation ideal. But I understand perfectly uh, the generic argument. But how do you relate the specialization of the hyper points to QK? That's my question. Well, you, you, need, you need something like that to translate to translate. Okay, maybe let let me try. Okay, I'm gonna go here. Maybe that's another way to see it. Um, okay, so you have like the family of ignorance. Continue this. Yeah, maybe yes. You're right. You're right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Let, let, let's stop. Let's let's just. I mean, mm -hmm. we should. Is it, is it, if you don't want it. Okay. Let's hear yeah. from Alex. Okay. 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 So yeah, yeah. Please discuss later. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay.